Well, a cabinet manual uh, is in a book form and it contains all the best practice guidance to the executive, basically. So it goes through a variety of issues in the New Zealand context, pretty much the same as the UK draft is doing as well. How to form governments, how ministers should behave, relationships between ministers uh, and officials, those sorts of issues are all set out in what I can best describe as a best practice manual. The New Zealand Cabinet Manual evolved actually over a period of time, which I think is probably the difference in, to some extent from the UK experience. And it was a collection, if you like, of officials uh, and uh, executive members' best practice, as I said. But when, when the people in New Zealand voted for a mixed member proportional system in '93, then that occasioned a rewriting of all the rules, if you like, relating to Parliament and the executive standing orders were, were um, rewritten and the Cabinet Manual had to be rewritten in a way to incorporate the new experience of multi-party government. So at that point it became not so much more formalised but it was on the website but it was, you could also buy a copy of it so it became the manual you could actually touch. Well, I, th I think in the UK there has always been guidance that, that has been there for the executive that's prepared, uh, in New Zealand it's prepared by the officials but in conjunction with members of the executive. So for instance when I was a member of Cabinet, um, Cabinet approved changes to the Cabinet manual but it was to record past practice. So it wasn't to anticipate problems so much, but it was to record uh, what would be the proper practice in a particular situation. In the United Kingdom, of course, um, the hung parliament in recent times, anyway, was a new experience for many people. In New Zealand, of course, the people had voted for a change. So there was a period of preparation and I think acceptance that that meant there had to be new ways of doing things. I think the first thing, it's a guidance for the executive. That's, that's the lens, if you like, through which the Cabinet Manual should be seen. I'm a supporter of it being prepared by officials in a neutral, independent way, so they just write down, in effect, what, is, what has happened and what is the practice. That then does have the overlay of the executive looking at it. Now, in New Zealand context, it doesn't go to the Parliament and it's not expected to go to the Parliament because its, it's focus is the executive. For the Parliament, matters uh, that are relevant obviously are in standing orders. So if you like, you've got two rule books. Slightly different, but two rule books. So in a way, um, I think uh, experienced officials uh, are certainly the best um, to do the draft, and then, of course, whoever is executive at the time and under democratic systems, executive changes, uh, they then also must accept um, what's, what's the, uh, in the guidebook. At the first cabinet meeting, and if there were changes through, throughout it as well, but it's, um, yes, it's sort of like taking the oath of the cabinet manual, you are going to abide by it. And personally, I found it really useful, um, both as a minister, but particularly as the Attorney General, because it does set down uh, what is the best practice. So you can advise ministers who, who need um, some guidance on how to behave in certain circumstances. I think it's a consensus. It's, it, the, the changes to the manual are done through discussion. It's not a contentious issue. It's not a competition. It's merely making sure there's an accurate record. Um, for instance, uh, caretaker government is an important issue. So you write down that, as we have in New Zealand, three months before a general election, um, it's in the cabinet manual and accepted that the executive at the time doesn't make um, uh, significant political appointments to bodies and doesn't actually incur new large public expenditure. So nor Normal work goes on, but you're not going to do um, big new projects knowing there's going to be a general election and who will know what the outcome is. Mm -hmm. 
I, I would think it's, it's useful regardless of, of whether there was um, coalition government or minority government. But certainly when the opportunities for doubt become greater or uncertainty, then the cabinet manual, I think, really does become an important document. So if you're likely to have greater uncertainty, as you may, under a minority or a coalition uh, arrangement, then the cabinet manual is essential, I think. I, I think its authority is that it's accepted by all parties. <laughs> So it's not so much a process that gives it its authority, it's the fact that it is and it's not legally enforceable, it's not binding on anybody, um, but it has an ex there is an expectation that the parties will abide by it. Now sometimes newer situations arise so therefore they're not in the cabinet manual and it's that in those circumstances you will find then that that experience is recorded. For instance, it's clarified that, that if there's an outgoing government, it doesn't in fact make any decisions that are likely to bind the incoming government. It might seem obvious, but sometimes it's good to have that actually written down. It's just accepted, and, and in fact it's important it's not legally enforceable. This is, as, as I keep saying, a best practice document. So it guides the parties, it provides certainty where there may be uncertainty. It's transparent, so if, it like, if you like, the Cabinet Manual sets out expected good behaviour. And therefore the parties are expected to follow that. If they don't, the media is likely to say something, the opposition might say something, uh, the public might say something. So there's an expectation of, of good behaviour. I, I personally, in the New Zealand context, would, would not see it at all like that. Uh, New Zealand, like the United Kingdom, we, we are quite unusual in not having one written uh, constitution. We have written constitutional documents, so but we don't have one one uh, particular piece of legislation we call the constitution. So uh, that's our practice. That's our tradition. May or may not change. But the cabinet manual isn't really anything to do with an, a written constitution. That's an entirely different process. As I said, if you keep on thinking of it as being a guide to the executive, if you look at the cabinet manual as being essentially an executive um, document, it's not a parliamentary document as such. It has implications for parliament and that's why it has to be transparent. But it's, if you look at it through the lens of the executive, that's just a small part of a constitutional arrangement. It depends on what the practices have been and uh, for instance uh, in 1999 the, the, there was a new coalition arrangement, what we call the agree to disagree clause and that was then incorporated within the cabinet manual subsequently. So the political practice led um, what was to happen and the cabinet manual merely recorded that. Does it change? Well it's been described like a dictionary. <laughs> Dictionaries change as new words, new practices, new interpretations come up. So uh, one of the cabinet secretaries in New Zealand said the cabinet manual is like a dictionary and we keep it up to date. I think in terms of, of constitutional practice, five years is at the outer edge of, of time. Um, New Zealand might be at the shorter edge, we only have three year uh, parliaments, so we have elections every three years. Four years seems to be the norm, and I think particularly under coalition or minority arrangements, five years is quite a long time, a lot can happen in that period of time. So you've got to have very strong trust relationships amongst the parties, and also also a capacity to be flexible in terms of changing what your commitment or your policies or your rules are. So five years is a long time. Mm. Well given the, the essential flexibility of the document that it can be changed without a great deal of formality to record past practice, it isn't like it's going to be fixed or it's going to be legally contested. So if there was a change of government and a new executive and a new set of circumstances, then in the New Zealand context that's recorded and each executive knows that. So it's not like it's um, carved in stone and can't be changed. In fact, its value is that it records reality. 
Well, I, I think I think there there is a feeling not only um, in in New Zealand but and in the UK that such a manual suited to one's local experience, history, circumstances is useful. I think the Canadians are starting to think about it. Uh, Australia has a form of, of cabinet manual as well. I think the, um, the New Zealand cabinet manual has been, been focused on is interesting because we don't have a written constitution. So it provides that very important certainty in times of uncertainty. Most times no one ever refers to it. You only ever refer to these things. <laughs> if there's a problem. And then you know you've got an authoritative guidance on how to resolve the problem and everybody knows it's transparent. I've uh, taken the opportunity to have a quick look at the draft and it would seem to me that it covers all the matters you would expect to see in a cabinet manual and is an extraordinarily useful document and certainly I, as I understand the, the two concerns may well have been that it, it would lead to a written constitution, I don't personally see that as an issue and that it might mean there is control by um, public officials of, of uh, practices of politicians. That's certainly not been the New Zealand experience and I'd be very surprised if it was the experience here.